Dennis Prager here. I am currently in the middle of a book whose author I am now about to interview, Profiles in Corruption, Abuse of Power by America's Progressive Elite, third best-selling book in the United States of America at this time on Amazon. It's superseded only by a novel and a basketball book, so... It, Oh, 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 it, oh, it's about Kobe Bryant? So it's his, autobiography. it's his autobiography. Oh, okay, I thought it was just a basketball book. All right, that makes sense. Profiles in Corruption, Peter Schweizer. And uh, Peter, welcome back to my show. Great to be on with you, Dennis. Thanks for having me. I want to tell you something. As I am reading your book, and it's uh, for for those who, who don't know, and obviously many of my listeners would know, Profiles in Corruption is about the corruption, indeed, as it says, about the progressive elite, specifically Kamala Harris, Joe Biden, Cory Booker, Elizabeth Warren, Sherrod Brown, Bernie Sanders, Amy Klobuchar, Eric Garcetti. Okay, just wanted people to know who, who it's about. So I, I need you to know, look, I've written 10 books, so... I have a sense of what it takes to write a serious book. I don't understand. Are you uh, a uh, a research center? Is Peter Schweizer the name of a group of people? I don't understand how you do so much research. <laughs> well, um, I'm the president of the Government Accountability Institute. Um, we were formed uh, shortly after I wrote a book called Throw Them All Out that you and Dennis and I talked about um, I am Dennis. Wait, wait. So wait, who who was the third person? I am Dennis, as you know. So you said yes. you, Dennis, and I. So Oh, sorry, sorry. That's yes. quite all right. Um, that, that I meant you, Dennis, and I. Oh, I see. Um, okay, yeah. okay. I got yeah, you. All right. Apologies. That's all right. Um, that, yeah, that uh, we decided coming out of that research where we exposed uh, insider trading on the stock market um, that uh, we needed to research this uh, um, regularly. Uh, it warranted it. So the Government Accountability Institute, our website, website is cronyism.com. You can see the reports and the work that we do in addition to the books I do. But we have a research team, uh, and we engage in heavy forensic research. So this book took 18 months of research. We had close to a dozen researchers working on it. Okay, um, so I was right. You, it, it, yes. It re yes, there really is an institution doing this research along with you. Yes. That's exactly right. Okay. And, you know, as you know, Dennis, from looking at the book, we don't use anonymous sources. We no, no, no. People. It's all forensic paper. No, and if anything is wrong, you would truly be called out on it. Yes, that's exactly right. I mean, I'm a, as I say, uh, to want my listeners to understand, it's astounding the amount of corruption in the, the – I've read the first half in, in each of those people's lives. It's depressing. And – uh, 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 the obvious question that most people would have is, why didn't you write about Republicans? Yes, and 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 I've written books. My previous book, Secret Empires, uh, was about Republicans and Democrats. There was a lot in there on uh, Mitch McConnell. I had a chapter on the Trumps. Um, I explain in the first chapter of the book, Dennis, that that I think we're living in a time right now when it comes to investigative work uh, that I call the Trump vortex. Um, Donald Trump is the most powerful man in the world. He needs scrutiny. We've scrutinized him. Other people have scrutinized him. But it's kind of like the eclipse of the sun. That's become the only thing uh, that has been the work of investigative journalists. Some of the reporting has been good. Some of it's been awful. Um, I felt the need to look at people that are either aspiring to his position or are in senior positions of responsibility um, to make sure that people know what they have in terms of connections, cronyism, corruption that they've engaged in. So at least the information is out there. Um, and I also believe that, as I point out in the first chapter of the book, these progressives are unique on the political landscape because unlike, you know, moderates, classical liberals, conservatives, and libertarians, progressives are the one group in America that are saying the size and scope of government is still way too small. 
we need a lot more power to fix your problems. Now, obviously, there's a real question about whether they could fix our problems, but the question I wanted to answer in the book is, these people that want so much more power, what have they actually done with the power they've had up until this point? And I think the, the, the case that I make is uh, they've done some things to uh, enrich their families and to benefit themselves, that they've served themselves rather than serve the public. That's the, uh, that's the chief conservative argument, dear listeners, against big government. You, unless you have angels in government, the more access they have to power, influence, and money, the more abuse they will be. It, it, you have to be a child to, to believe that bigger government doesn't mean more corruption. <laughs> that, your, your book should be the required reading, forgetting if you're a Republican or a Democrat, just to understand what happens when people have access to so much power. They make their families rich. I mean, it, it's an astonishing thing what they get away with. What, what are places like the New York Times doing? Do they just say, we won't, we won't tell everybody about Kamala Harris's background? What do they, what do they think? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, you know, I've done a lot of work in the past. Uh, you know, when I even did the book Clinton Cash a couple of years ago, the New York Times uh, did follow-on reporting, uh, confirming my reporting. Um, there really has been no interest uh, from those publications um, in this material. And again, everything in this book, you can go through the, the footnotes. There's 1,128 footnotes in this book. Um, and you, you can replicate everything. You can look at the court documents, the corporate records, the financial records, um, all the material we use, you can replicate and confirm the facts that we are reporting. Um, so it's not difficult to do, but there, there seems to be, and I think part of it is this um, a sort of singular obsession with Trump. And, and look, I get it. Uh, part of it is he's the most powerful man in the world. But the other part of it is there is this fixation, I think, within the media to say, I want to be the guy that finally does this guy in. Um, that's fine. I mean, you can do that, but, but you cannot and should not do that at the expense of reporting on other people. You need to know who Elizabeth Warren's family does commercial business with and how she made her money. You need to know Bernie Sanders' financial secrets. You need to know the fact that, you know, five members of Joe Biden's family did very, very well while he was vice president for things they really weren't qualified to be paid for. You need to know those things, and that's why we felt the need to do this book. <laughs> Uh, it's, it is, it is. I have to say, on some level, a little depressing. <laughs> the, the, it's just one thing on top of the other. Uh, you don't have to answer this, and it's, it, it's only out of interest and curiosity that I ask it. Of the list of major Democrats that I just enumerated for the listeners... Are some more egregious than others, or are they all pretty much egregious? Uh, I think some are more egregious than others. You know, it's interesting, Dennis. Um, I've had a lot of friends and uh, uh, people who have, have read the book, and, and different chapters stand out to them in different ways. Uh, some right. people are shocked by Joe Biden. Others read the Bernie Sanders chapter, and they're like, my God, I, n I never heard any of this before, and I'm shocked. Uh, the Kamala Harris one resonates with people because you're dealing in some cases with, with as I argue in the book, basically covering up some very, very serious crimes. Um, so it's a hard question to answer. I think it, it, it's, um, it's going to be in the, in the eye of the beholder, as it were, um, for people to decide, because the methodologies and the approaches that these individuals use are often very different, too. Some of them are merely trying to uh, enrich their families. Others are trying to concentrate power for their political benefit. Um, so the methods and the styles are, are very different. When I read the Kamala Harris chapter, I, what came to my mind, and we're going to take a break and then I'd like you to answer it. What came to my mind was the fixation on infidelity on the part of Donald Trump. But, I mean, if, if what you wrote is true, and I, even I had a sense of this prior to reading your book, uh, you know, she was with a married man for years uh, just to uh, get in, in, into positions of power. 
you don't have to be married, folks, to commit adultery. You know, I, I am not fixated on it, but people are fixated on Donald Trump's sexual past. I want Peter Schweizer to tell me why they wouldn't be if Kamala Harris, let's say, is chosen as a vice presidential candidate. The book is Profiles in Corruption. Peter Schweizer is the author, and it's up at DennisPrager.com. The Dennis Prager Show, live from the Relief Factor Pain-Free Studio. Hi, everybody. Dennis Prager here. I'm in the middle of Peter Schweizer's Profiles in Corruption. And it's meticulously researched, 1,100 footnotes. And I'm sure if any of it was not, were not true, he would either be sued or be skewered by the left. Kamala Harris, Joe Biden, Cory Booker, Elizabeth Warren, Sherrod Brown, Bernie Sanders, Amy Klobuchar, Eric Garcetti. So I was asking you if uh, Kamala Harris... Joe Biden was asked about her, would he, if he's nominated, would he choose her for vice presidential candidate? Said she'd be excellent. She's, uh, I'm not offering it to her, but uh, necessarily now, uh, but she'd be terrific. If she were nominated, would her past come out, her sexual past, like that of Donald Trump? Well, I would think it should because it's directly tied to her rise in political power. I mean, that's that's why it's relevant. You know, she she begins dating Willie Brown. She's, I think, at the time, 28 years old. Willie's in his, you know, mid 60s. Willie's been married uh, at this point for, you know, for you know, 45 years or something like that. Um, and uh, at the time, you know, she is sort of a a, a low level lawyer in in San Francisco. Um, and Willie Brown starts taking her everywhere. She meets all the power players. He, he buys her, I think, a BMW 7 Series uh, to drive around. Um, and he becomes mayor of San Francisco. Um, the relationship you know, kind of falls apart. There's a dispute about who broke up with who, but the political alliance and relationship remains. So when she runs for uh, San Francisco district attorney in, in 2003, um, she outraises the incumbent by four to five fold, uh, largely a result of the fact that Willie Brown's political machine is raising money for her. Her campaign manager is a Willie Brown uh, uh, ally. Um, the fundraising team is made up of Willie Brown allies. And so she becomes San Francisco district attorney. And the other part of that story, of course, Dennis, is that once she becomes San Francisco attorney, what she does, as we lay out in the book, is she drops all these corruption um, uh, charges that are being brought against Willie Brown's political allies by her predecessor. Um, so absolutely that relationship, uh, you know, needs to be discussed because it's very reflective, I believe, on how she has exercised power. Right. However, I just want to say to my listeners, the chances of it being as widely reported and repeated as Donald Trump's infidelities is zero. Just, yeah. just wanted to note that. That's one of yes, the reasons. Absolutely. Yeah, that's right. It's very sad. So I, you go through this list and, and you think, whoa, aren't Bernie Sanders and AB, Amy Klobuchar clean-cut folks? Why don't you comment on those two? Yeah, I mean, you know, what's interesting about Bernie Sanders is really uh, his entire adult life has been in politics. Um, in the 1970s, he ran for the Senate. Um, he, he collected unemployment insurance while he was a candidate. Um, he commented to friends, we, we quote them in the book, that he believed, you know, basic labor and work was moron work. Uh, he was not interested in that. Uh, he basically sees his political fortunes rise when he becomes elected mayor of Burlington in Vermont, one of the first things he does is hire, put on the payroll, um, his then-girlfriend, later wife, Jane Sanders. Um, if you look at the local accounts in, in Burlington, Vermont, the city council objected. They said, you can't just create a job. Um, you, you know, there's no job. You're creating a job for her. There's no, um, you know, open competition for that job. You just can't hand it out to your girlfriend. 
he basically ignored the city council. Uh, then when Bernie Sanders runs for Congress, uh, what does he do? He realizes one of the dirty secrets in Washington, D.C., which is you can make a lot of money being a so-called media buyer for a political candidate. If a candidate spends, say, a million dollars on television or radio ads, the media buyer is entitled to a 15 percent commission. Uh, and that doesn't have to be disclosed who gets the commission. So, Dennis, what happens? Bernie Sanders hires his wife, Jane, as his media buyer. Um, and what, what, I believe uh, she... uh, Why do they use politicians as media buyers to begin with? <laughs> Well, yeah, it's, you know, the campaign, right? The Bernie Sanders campaign is going to buy television ads for his campaign. They're going to send it to a media company, somebody that, that's an expertise. has. Expertise oh, I thought you were saying that others used Bernie Sanders oh, for yes, their yeah. campaigns. Right, yeah. No, this so is why Bernie would Sanders they do that? I don't understand. Well, he, he certainly didn't do it because she was qualified. She had no background in media buying. He did it because she made money, by our estimate, at least $150,000 doing it. And that. what was the benefit to the candidate using her? Uh, the, there's, there's really no benefit at all. In fact, he's hiring a media buyer that's less experienced, has no experience compared to competing media buyers. Uh, this is the agent that, that decides, you know, this local radio station is going to get this ad. This right. So they, but they think that. they'll benefit by getting on Bernie Sanders' good side. Well, the, the, yeah, it's to, it's to sort of advocate for the campaign, right? They're running the commercials, but, you know, vote for Bernie Sanders for Congress. Those advertisements are being bought by the campaign, and they're spending money, and they're hiring. No, right. No, I got that. I'm, I'm, uh, forgive yeah. me. I'm still preoccupied with the non-Bernie Sanders candidates using Mrs. Sanders. What is in it for them to use her to buy ads? Well, that's that's a good question. Um, I'm, I'm certainly you want to curry favor. Maybe you're going to get a Bernie endorsement. Okay, so that's uh, what I was uh, that's what I was wondering. D did, does yeah. it work out for them? Is is that is that in fact what happens? Yes, it does seem that that's what's happened. They set up, you know, Jane Sanders set up a business registered in their home. She took on other clients. Again, there's not really a need to disclose how much you're getting paid, uh, but we know that it took place. And the great mystery in, in all of this, Dennis, is when he runs for president in 2016, of course, the media buying, we're not talking about a few million dollars. He spends $83 million on media buys while he's president, uh, while he's presidential candidate. Um, the commission on that's probably $12 million. The media buying for the Bernie Sanders campaign runs through a company called Old Town Media. Now, Old Town Media doesn't have a website, doesn't really do business with anybody else. It's registered to a home in suburban Virginia. Um, the two individuals, the two ladies that are the registered owners of that business, are longtime Jane Sanders friends that worked with her on Bernie Media Buys before. Um, and the real kicker here is she was actually, Jane Sanders was actually asked by a progressive reporter in Vermont what she knew about Old Town Media. Did she have any connections with Old Town Media? Uh, and Jane Sanders just hung up the phone. So we, we don't know who got commissions related to that, but it's one of the problems in Washington. These things are not required to be disclosed. Did he become a multimillionaire, uh, Bernie Sanders, in his lifetime as a an office holder? Uh, yes, he did. Um, and he did it a couple of ways. One uh, was, of course, uh, he and Jane share assets jointly. Uh, so Jane has made money uh, working for him politically. Uh, book writing. Uh, nobody has been more prolific in writing books than Bernie Sanders. Um, and unlike, say, John McCain, who donated a portion of the profits of his books to charity, uh, Bernie has not done that. All right, what I don't know. All right, we're going to figure that out. Profiles in Corruption, Peter Schweizer. The Dennis Prager Show, live from the Relief Factor Pain-Free Studio. I'm Dennis Prager. My guest is Peter Schweizer, Profiles in Corruption. One of the top three books in sales in the United States of all types on Amazon, which is the place to figure out what book is selling, much much more so than the New York Times. By the way, is it on the New York Times list? 
Yes, it's debuting at number two. It's it's impossible to figure out that list. <laughs> <laughs> it is. Yeah, no, no. I, I, I'm glad you are, but I. What is number one on their list? Do you know? Uh, I think it's the book by the two Washington Post reporters, Very Stable Genius, uh, which is a book that relies on a lot of anonymous sources, something which I don't do. And what is it about? Uh, it's about Donald Trump. It's, uh, it's a look at Donald Trump and, and uh, the operation of the White House. Oh, that's interesting. So that's very interesting. Shows the division of the country, if, if that's one and you're two. By the way, that's not, not one, two, or three on Amazon. The one that's number one uh, on theirs. Anyway, back to Bernie Sanders. I read to you folks uh, the list of uh, major progressive politicians that are uh, reported on in this book. So I, I did research myself on Bernie Sanders. According to Forbes last April, he has amassed two and a half million dollar fortune. They use that word. Bought himself with cash a a, a summer home in Vermont. His books, I, I'm not used to books making millionaires, but in fact, his 2016 book, Our Revolution, sold almost a quarter of a million copies. That's a million dollars there. So that's really how it worked. But that's not corrupt selling books. No, it's not. But what's interesting in, in Bernie Sanders' case is a couple of things. And I think it, it's a reminder, Dennis, as, as economists would say, incentives matter. Um, the only way that a U.S. senator can make money um, other than, you know, having investments or, or, you know, real estate or whatever is by writing books. And Bernie Sanders um, has done that with a vengeance. Um, he's actually, in the last five years, written more books than he has successfully co-sponsored legislation since he's been in Congress since 1990. Um, it, it's, it's an astonishing emphasis, I think, on where he is spending his time uh, and his energy. And the other thing, Dennis, is that uh, with some of his books, um, he actually has his uh, nonprofit organization or his political action committee actually buy copies of his own books, um, which certainly uh, benefits sales. <laughs> so there's, That's there's, true. there's a lot here, a lot here at work. All right, let's go to Joe Biden, even though I wanted to hear about uh, Amy Klobuchar because she's, you know, Mrs. Clean, as it were, in people's eyes. But let's, uh, if we have time, we will. Let's go to Joe Biden. What struck me was essentially everyone associated with him in his family became rich. Is that fair? Yes, that is fair. Uh, and, and largely during the tenure when he was vice president. I mean, when he was a senator, yes, they had various things going on. But once he became vice president, it, it went to another level. Um, you know, we call them the Biden Five because they're five uh, family members. And, it, you know, it, it works sort of very simply. I mean, I'll give you give you uh, one example. Um, uh, a guy named Kevin Justice uh, started a construction company called Hillstone International. Uh, goes and visits uh, the Biden office in the White House, according to White House visitor logs, uh, in November of 2010, the only visit this guy ever makes to the White House. Uh, we don't know what was discussed with Biden, but, but we do know that three weeks later, Kevin Justice appoints Joe Biden's brother, James Biden, as the executive vice president of the construction company. Now, what's interesting about this, Dennis, is that he has no experience in construction or in construction management, no background whatsoever. Um, what happens six months later is even more stunning. This new construction firm with a vice president's brother as vice president uh, lands a contract to build 100,000 homes in Iraq. It's a $1.5 billion contract that they land. Um, and that's the beginning of a series of contracts that they get with the federal government, with the Department of Defense, State Department, et cetera. Um, you know, that to me speaks to the kind of cronyism that uh, people get so frustrated with. And, and that's just one brother. Uh, there are many other examples that are. Is this to the that. brother that was uh, in, in an accident? No, that's Frank. Frank is the other, yes, Frank is the other brother. All right, well, let me come back. Uh, that story is uh, very jolting, I have to say. I, I, I was affected by that story in a negative way.
The book is Profiles in Corruption. It's all sourced. Peter Schweizer is the author of the book. I will stay with you. We'll make it to the other side. Like lovers do. This show is now available on live video streaming on Town Hall TV, as well as our website. If you want to watch the show, not just listen, go to townhall.com and click on the Town Hall TV button. I'm Dennis Prager speaking with and to Peter Schweizer, author now of the brand new book, Profiles in Corruption. It's, it's, it's beyond belief illuminating. It's illuminating of darkness, but it's illuminating. And it's about eight different, is it eight different uh, p figures that you analyze? Yes, it's eight, eight different Right, figures, okay. Yes. So we're talking about Joe Biden, and we're going to get to Hunter in a moment. But I, I was struck, because I felt I knew something about Hunter, but I was struck at every member of his family enriched by being a relative of Joe Biden, the vice president of the United States. So I certainly didn't know, and most people don't, that he had a, another brother. So tell us about the other brother and his brush with the law. Yeah, so uh, his, his other brother's name is Frank Biden, um, and Frank Biden um, was uh, out in San Diego, uh, California. This is around 2000, um, and he rented a Jaguar when driving around with a friend. Um, they had some girls in the back seat, um, and the friend, Frank Biden's friend, was driving, uh, going something like 75 in a 35 zone at night, uh, struck uh, a um, uh, pedestrian um, and killed him. Now, according to the police report, which we've read, Frank Biden instructed the driver after this happened to keep driving, to drive off. Um, the driver ended up being charged and going to jail uh, for reckless driving. Frank Biden was sued by the victim's family because the victim uh, was a single father, and he had two teenage daughters um, that survived him. So he was sued um, on you know, negligent conduct, um, did not show up in court, did not respond at all to the charges. Um, and the court said, you know, you're liable for $250,000 for what you have, um, you know, your, your part in this. Um, the interesting thing, Dennis, is that he essentially um, became uh, invisible and started doing business in places like Costa Rica and Jamaica Belize uh, that are beyond the reach of courts. Now, the estate to this family, um, you know, hired private investigators to try to find him, realize that he was spending time at his brother Joe's house in in uh, Delaware. Uh, they also reached out by letter uh, to Senator Joe Biden. And Joe Biden's response, frankly, we have a copy of the letter from his chief of staff, uh, is, is pretty cold. I mean, it basically says, yes, you know, we understand that, that that this happened, but, you know, I'm certainly not personally liable, um, and Frank doesn't have the money, um, so, you know, good luck. Um, and what's happened is that when Joe Biden became vice president in 2009, he has helped his brother uh, build these businesses in places like Costa Rica. The brother who and owes a quarter of a million dollars to the family of, of the person that was run over and killed by the driver friend of, of Frank Biden, whom he was egging on to f go faster and faster. Yeah, that's exactly right. And that debt, by the way, is now, because that was a while ago, he hasn't paid it, he hasn't responded, uh, that debt is now over $900,000. Was he unfindable for a period of time? Yes. Yes, he was. They hired, they hired private detectives. They, they have tried to find uh, assets and other things that they could seize because this is a debt that, uh, that he's incurred and he has not contested. But again, if you're doing business deals in Costa Rica where he's doing them or Central America or Jamaica, that's obviously beyond the reach of U.S. courts. How long was he on the lam? 
Uh, it's hard to know. It's hard to know. I mean, he 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 has a a residence in Florida where he lives, but he apparently does not own that residence. Um, he does have some businesses in Florida, um, but it's very very hard to know. I mean, he's he's a a mysterious figure because he shows up at White House events, at state dinners. He has a meeting somehow. Uh, Frank Biden, his brother, has a meeting with Barack Obama and three or four other people in the Oval Office. So he's certainly certainly is getting access um, to power in Washington, but as far as the court is concerned and, and, and the lawyers representing the estate, um, they, are, they have a hard time finding him. All right, Hunter now. So everybody knows that Hunter was on the board of a natural gas company, which was corrupt, uh, Burisma, and let's go from there. It, what if let's say Hunter Biden were called as a witness, what could be asked of him that would be incriminating, if anything, of Joe Biden? Well, I think a couple of things. First, there's the whole question of the timing. You know, there's a question of why was he hired, but the timing is very damning. I mean, go back to February of 2014. That's when Vladimir Putin invades Crimea and sets off the crisis in Ukraine. That's February of 2014. The next month in March, Barack Obama says Joe Biden is going to be the point person on all Western aid flowing to Ukraine. So that's a pretty important position for the Ukrainians right? Within three weeks of that appointment, the Ukrainians suddenly desire, uh, decide that now is the time to hire Hunter Biden and to put him on this energy board. Um, so, you know, my question would be, first of all, why were you hired and why were you hired when you were hired? Uh, the other question that I would ask is, what discussions did you have um, involving Burisma? Now, you know, we have the transcript of Donald Trump's phone call with Zelensky. There are no doubt transcripts of phone calls that Joe Biden had with Ukrainian officials. I mean, he was the point person on it. It would be very, very interesting to see what oh, those discussions were. Oh, that's right. And, right. and, you know, and I, I, I think if we're going to be fair about this, we ought to have the, all of those transcripts uh, released. We have the Zelensky one. Let's have the Biden ones. Because we know, for example, that Joe Biden was leading a USAID, that's United States uh, Agency for International Development Program. All right, hold on there. Peter Schweizer, Profiles in Corruption. in corruption. I want to finish here with Hunter Biden because we don't have a lot of time, unfortunately. I could do this for a day with Peter Schweizer. That's how much research his group has put into these figures. Cory Booker stands out in my mind. I just want you to know that just human to human as an unsavory figure. But back to uh, Hunter Biden. Do you believe that the prosecutor that Joe Biden had fired, do you believe he was investigating Hunter Biden and Burisma? Yeah, we know two things, uh, Dennis. First of all, we know uh, based on documents in Ukraine and from his own testimony that they were investigating Burisma. They were investigating Hunter Biden. They were also investigating uh, the two oligarchs involved with Burisma, um, one of them named Lechevsky, who had had his assets seized uh, because of all kinds of concerns about uh, fraud and money laundering. The other oligarch named Kolomoisky, very, very interesting, uh, ran the Privat Bank, uh, where more than a billion dollars in U.S. aid money just disappeared. Um, and yet, despite that, this is interesting, um, he was granted the ability to travel in the United States shortly after Hunter Biden joined the board of Burisma. And there's all kinds of questions of why was Kolomoisky now suddenly uh, no longer persona non grata in the United States. So when Joe Biden boasted that he got rid of the prosecutor, uh, it, it's it's a little arrogant that he would boast publicly of getting rid of the prosecutor who was finding information on his son. 
Yes, I think, you know, look, the, the, the prosecutor, Shokin, there's no question that there were uh, questions about whether he was a straight shooter, and I think he probably was not, based on the evidence. But, you know, that's sort of the defense that's been offered uh, by Biden. Well, he was corrupt, and that was why I was getting rid of him. But the problem is that it still is a massive conflict of interest to be calling for the firing of a prosecutor who is looking into your son and looking into the people that are paying your son a million dollars a year for a job uh, that he's not really doing anything for and is not qualified for. Who would be uh, more important for the Republicans to have as a witness, in other words, to interrogate or to question in the Senate, Hunter or Joe? I think Joe, actually, um, because Joe has not been honest um, about his knowledge of his son's dealings. I mean, he made this, Joe Biden made this blanket statement uh, that I've never had a conversation with any of my family members as it relates to uh, business activities. Mm -hmm. Well, we know based on Hunter's account himself, that's not true. Okay. And there are examples and profiles in corruption of Joe there are literally right. setting up meetings for his this, son-in-law. This but, book is is, is uh, truly required re reading. Congratulations to you, Peter Schweizer. Thank you, Dennis. Always great to be on with you. Thank you.